Up, a short word that's a tall order. Up your game, up the ante, and if you stumble, you get back up. Up isn't easy, and we ought to know. We're in the business of up. Every day, Delta flies a quarter of a million people while investing billions in proving everything from booking to baggage claim. We're raising the bar on flying, and tomorrow, we will up it yet again. The question that I would like to pose has to do with the pivot, the shift to Asia. And the, 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 the question I would like to ask more specifically is, how significant do you think this pivot is on the ground? That is, what are the indicators of real impact or progress? What indicators should we look to to know whether this has had an impact and whether it will have an impact um, on the ground, both for American interests and for the particular countries um, of the region. Let me just answer the question by uh, saying how the, the, the pivot or rebalance is playing out in Malaysia. Um, and to do that, let me give just a little bit of context. Uh, if you look back at history, we had a some good form, firm foundations with Malaysia. The Peace Corps was heavily deployed in Malaysia. In fact, in 1967, it was the number two country in the world in terms of number of Peace Corps volunteers uh, deployed, the number one being India. Uh, for a country that was at that time smaller than it is now, it's a medium-sized country, just under 30 million people right now, it was quite remarkable and it was a um, a gesture of Malaysia wanting to, uh, it opened up its secondary schooling and wanted as many uh, Americans to help with the teaching and setting up of teaching and other technical assistance that, uh, as Malaysia started to develop. Um, in the 70s, Malaysia made a big effort to recruit uh, American businesses to invest, particularly in the electronics industry, um, uh, assembling computers, and, and we had uh, Dell and uh, HP and Intel and others set up at that time, and those investments have only grown. And that has uh, created a, a real relationship with some major companies, the number and depth of, uh, and, and, and uh, investments of which has grown considerably over the decades. And, um, and then in the 80s, Malaysia, uh, again looking to develop, sent an enormous number of students to the United States, at, at one point becoming the leading country in number of students in studying in the United States, um, also an indication of a, of a very um, assertive development uh, uh, plan that Malaysia had and the role that the United States played in that. So U.S. business um, and education uh, and people-to-people -people ties um, had a role to play in what turned out to be really a spectacular economic growth that Malaysia experienced from sort of the 70s up through the 90s in particular, uh, where infrastructure, where a country that had been uh, quite a, uh, uh, you know, a country that was not wild, not very much developed, grew into a place where now you have tremendous infrastructure throughout the country um, and, uh, and a very large uh, middle class that is able to uh, spend and grow and provide for their kids in ways that were not possible before. However, over a, a bunch of that, a serious chunk of that period, we didn't have close political relationships. We were um, estranged over some issues and, uh, and there wasn't a lot of, uh, of, uh, uh, of experience at the governmental levels and even at the non-governmental levels with our countries. And I think in that way we sort of drifted apart uh, on and off for various reasons. Um, that changed quite dramatically in 2009 when uh, two things happened uh, at the same time almost, and that was President Obama was elected uh, and coming as a Pacific, uh, first Pacific president born in Hawaii and, and spent time in Indonesia, uh, focused on Asia, began the pivot, the rebalance early on, sending Secretary Clinton on her first trip to Asia, um, contrary to the tradition of secretaries of state, uh, but also the new prime minister in Malaysia, Prime Minister Najib, came into uh, office in April and explicitly said he wanted to improve the relationship with the United States. And I think this, that interest on both of the leaders' part was a reflection in part on what was happening in both our countries. Uh, in Malaysia, you had uh, um, demographic shifts, more young people in the cities who were looking to connect more with the world. You also had a, a, an economic goal in Malaysia to reach go from middle, sort of upper middle income status to a high income status by 2020. And the recognition that to do that needed to connect with the technology and education and trade and investment of the developed world and particularly the United States or strengthen those connections. Um, 
The U.S. also, obviously, looking to Asia as the engine, the economic engine uh, of the world uh, with the high growth rates that many countries in Asia were experiencing. I think there were strategic reasons as well. Um, uh, Malaysia's place in the world uh, being uh, on the one side, Mal the Malacca Straits, which is a, a huge shipping um, uh, passage for, the, for much of the goods of the world and certainly a lot of the oil and gas, and also located as well on the South China Sea. Um, uh, there was, a, um, I think there was also an important recognition on both sides that it was in the interest of both countries to sort of repair and build relations uh, between the United States and countries with significant Muslim communities and Malaysia being a Muslim majority country. Uh, this has been a theme of Prime Minister Najib and certainly of President Obama. Um, out of his Cairo speech and, and subsequent actions. And so there was a desire to do that. Um, so we built, we put together over the last couple of years a relationship that was much more comprehensive than what we had had in the past, which was a very successful sort of trade and investment relationship and a, a pretty good military to military relationship. But a lot of the in between uh, cooperation hadn't been as much developed. So on the trade and investment side, strengthening that, Malaysia joined the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which David spoke about, which is an 11, now 11 country free trade negotiation that's really quite beyond the normal free trade negotiations, one that's going to, uh, that for the countries when we ultimately conclude it, which we hope will be next year, um, will really put those countries on the map as premier destinations for trade and investment for open access. Um, uh, in education, we put, uh, we have been connecting our educational institutions. There are tremendous interest and opportunities in education uh, between the United States and Malaysia. Um, we, uh, President, Prime Minister Najib asked President Obama in 2010 if we could sort of recreate the Peace Corps in a certain small way and send some Americans to help teach English, in, particularly in rural areas of Malaysia. And uh, we just last year had 50 American college graduates through what's called the Fulbright English Teaching Assistance Program, which anyone can apply for online. It's a, a great experience. Um, and these 50 Americans just left in uh, November. We'll have 75 come in January for 10 months, and we're hoping the next year 100. Because this program is incredibly successful, it, it creates uh, a people-to-people -people relationship similar to that which we experienced under the Peace Corps, but it also um, helps address uh, sort of native English speaking uh, language ability and is a huge hit in Malaysia. The, the English teaching assistants are, are real celebrities. Um, we've done a lot on entrepreneurship, on science and technology, um, a whole lot of areas uh, that Malaysia is interested in in order to, re again, attain this 2020 goal it has set for itself. And we've developed our security and law enforcement uh, cooperation. So we recently had, for example, Attorney General Holder signed an MOU on transnational crime cooperation. A lot of the issues David Carden was referring to were able to now play out uh, with much more uh, vigor than we were in the past. Now, I wanted to say Malaysia is not only uh, looking to the United States to Im improving relations with the United States, it has make, take, make, taken a big effort to strengthen relations with uh, Singapore, with Indonesia, with Thailand, inside the region, beyond the region with Turkey, with Australia, um, and with China. Though China is a very um, traditionally a very good partner for Malaysia, now the number one trading partner, the United States is number four for Malaysia, um, and, uh, and relations with China and Malaysia are very good, and Malaysia, like no, all the countries in this region, you know, doesn't want to have to choose, and we don't want, to, we, we don't want them to choose either. I mean, it's, it's good for us that Malaysia has a good relationship with China and a very strong and growing relationship with the United States. Um, so I'll wrap up by just saying that um, the rebalance or the pivot has sort of allowed us with the a whole series, for example, of high-level visits and, uh, and resources that uh, are now concentrated on the, on the Asia-Pacific region and maybe for the first time in a significant way on Southeast Asia uh, to develop a relationship that's just much closer, much more networked, and, uh, and I think holds a lot of optimism and promise for the future because it's focused a lot on youth, on entrepreneurship, on, on laying foundations that will, you know, in 10, 20 years from now, we will see develop and come to fruition.